Ted Townsend, welcome to K7 Project Bluebird. Thanks, Mike. Yeah. Could you uh, cast your mind back to when you were 31 years old and working as a tyre fitter for National Tyre Service in, uh, in Renmark here, uh, when you received a very interesting phone call? The, the call actually led to you becoming a member of Donald Campbell's 1963 World Land Speed Record attempt at Lake Eyre. How did that uh, all come about for you? Well, it was uh, firstly a great uh, surprise and, and uh, uh, certainly an honour to be chosen to uh, uh, be part of the Bluebird uh, team. And um, uh, going back, I was uh, 31 years of age, so that's a fair, fair few years ago now, uh, being a single bloke and was keen to take on all these sorts of things and... and um, uh, represent uh, the uh, the company, and uh, particularly being a local boy, I thought it was a great uh, experience to to uh, have. And National Tire Service was part of the Dunlop Company, I believe. It was, yes, yeah. You were essentially representing them, and uh, Dunlop were the uh, tire sponsor for Bluebird's uh, um, land speed record attempt. Well, not only were they the sponsors, but they were actually the manufacturers of the of the tyres. The mm -hmm. English uh, company Dunlop uh, Tyre, mm -hmm. um, and um, they had manufactured uh, tyres for all the previous land speed attempts that uh, Donald Campbell's father had had made, Sir Malcolm Campbell, and uh, so they had always been very much involved uh, in the uh, land speed attempt. Uh, this particular year was the first year that they were trying tubeless tyres on the, the Bluebird and so that was uh, quite interesting. As a, as a uh, young bloke from the bush, how did you actually travel from Renmark to uh, get to Malurina Station where the uh, temple was based? Well, I tra first travelled, I left uh, Renmark and went uh, to Adelaide uh, by my own uh, car. And then the next day I um, met uh, Andrew Mustard who was from England and he was in charge of the project as far as Dunlops were concerned. And he uh, was uh, the one that, that uh, as I say, was in charge of the project. And, and he then, having met him, uh, told me what my role was going to be. And then um, he said, we have... Uh, a vehicle for you to drive to uh, um, Maluruna Station, that was the base. Uh, the vehicle was a Land Rover utility. They had two uh, utilities, two Land Rovers, and both were fitted up with a, a gantry and to use a, um, an endless chain to lift the, the tyres into uh, the vehicle. Uh, I received this uh, ute on the Friday and then Saturday took off for uh, uh, Malurna, uh, having travelled uh, to uh, Copley, which is in the Flinders, uh, for the first night. And a lot of the roads then were, were dirt roads, so it was pretty rough and dusty sort of a, a trip. Uh, the next morning I travelled through Lee Creek through the coal fields there. That was interesting just to have a look at the, the big drag line working. And then uh, finally arrived at Maree uh, around about uh, oh, midday. Then another 30 miles in those days, 50 kilometres or thereabouts, travel from Maree out to Maluruna Station uh, on my own. And I guess this is one of the reasons why I was chosen Having been in the country most of, all my life, uh, we was used to that sort of um, uh, atmosphere and uh, arrived at Maluran and made myself known to whoever there and, and so it went on from there for the next six weeks. Ah, so you were there for six weeks and uh, what sort of accommodation was provided for you and the other team members? Oh, fairly basic accommodation. Uh, um, the uh, team had uh, uh, hired quite a few caravans from uh, the ENWS department at that stage. <coughs> and so we lived in uh, caravans. 
And uh, when I say we, I uh, uh, was with uh, Andrew Mustard. Uh, then there were the two English tyre fitters. Uh, they were in a caravan uh, together. Our meals were supplied uh, by the company at a dining room that Elliot Price had, uh, the owner of Malura and Association, he'd set up this uh, shed which became a, a hangar for his aircraft uh, later on. But uh, for this purpose it was chosen to be the, the kitchen. So we had uh, all our meals there, our, our lunch time sometimes we were there, other times we would take uh, lunches with us if we were going out to the lake. What sort of hours were involved in each day you were up there on the speed attempt? Oh, that's a, that's a good question. Certainly more than our, eight hours uh, at times. Uh, the interesting thing about that was um, the chap from Dunlops who actually gave me the job or got me the job, the, the South Australian manager of Dunlops, uh, Mr Ken uh, Scrutton, if I was returning from the lake, he always had a, and he was at the, the station bar, uh, he always had a bottle of beer there for me because it was six o'clock closing and uh, uh, even out there. The reason why I had to be adhered to was the fact that there was quite a big police force out there as well. <laughs> so uh, it was always uh, good to meet up with uh, Ken and have a beer with him and... Uh, He'd be asking me what uh, was happening out there on the lake, which is another 30 miles away from the uh, homestead. Andrew Mustard would have been your supervisor uh, up was, there? At the yes, time. I had quite a lot of contact uh, with him, particularly later on uh, when we were to, to wind the, the project up for that uh, for 1963 attempt. While you were up there, did you have much at all to do with Donald Campbell throughout the record attempt? Not really, not really. Uh, uh, he sort of uh, was with his own uh, group and uh, um, I was only just a common tyre fitter, uh, I guess, as far as he was concerned. And so your actual role was not just fitting the wheels to Bluebird. What else uh, was involved? On one occasion, uh, there was a bit of a lull in the process and, and um, uh, it was decided that uh, we should try and seek another track for, for the Bluebird. Uh, and so uh, Andrew said to me, what do you think about coming out and doing a bit of exploring? So uh, away we went. We had a uh, flying doctor radio with us to be in contact with uh, Maluruna Base uh, uh, radio if uh, we needed any help and so we actually went to uh, a little spot called uh, Jackboot Bay and um, we spent a night out there and the idea was that we would um, uh, keep in touch with the the base on a at Malura on, on a certain time and so uh, being pretty raw to uh, flying doctor radio I wasn't sure whether I was doing the right thing or not and had the aerial and everything set up as per instruction from, from uh, uh, Elliot Price. And uh, anyway, eventually when we got back to Elliot Price, I said, oh, we tried to make contact with you last night. And he said, yeah, sorry. He said, I forgot about it, uh, that you were out there. And, and so I didn't bother about, about answering any calls. Yeah. Anyway, our time out at Jackboot Bay uh, we explored uh, the possibility of another track, and which didn't uh, it didn't uh, take off anyway. So there was only actually the one track that was used in 1963. Yeah, yeah. With um, this being, uh, uh, I guess, a, a first in Australia to uh, attempt the land speed record, what so was a, the approximate size of the team members involved in this attempt? Uh, when you consider there were, were uh, four, five, six of us involved with uh, tyres, there was uh, a chap involved with the starting of the motor on, on in the Bluebird. There was um, uh, the police, they had a role to play. Um, the fuel people, the, they had a whole team and uh, they were always used to think they were lucky because all they had to do was to be out there, fill up the, 
bluebird and and when that was done they just sat around and did nothing until it ran out again and needed refueling and whatever the time of the day was they they could then leave the lake and come back to the homestead if they were out on the lake whereas uh, with us with the tyres uh, these uh, banners that we had to uh, uh, give the um, mile by mile down the, the uh, uh, track we had to uh, fold them up at the night time and they were, they were 15 mile away from the first one to the last one was 15 miles so and then we had to turn around and come back again so uh, round trip was about 30 miles you know then there was the distance from where the base camp on the lake was to get off the lake that was about another seven miles mm. and then we had to drive back to Maluruna on a dirt track so it was quite a lot involved and we were always the last ones to leave the lake. We were, <laughs> most times we were the first ones and then we were also the last ones uh, to leave the lake because of our involvement with the, the attempt. The Bluebird CN7 was powered by a Bristol Siddeley Proteus gas turbine, but Bluebird wasn't just pushed forward by the thrust of the jet engine, was it? No, no, it had to be, I think the rules and regulations of the land speed attempt for this particular type of vehicle had to be through a transmission and uh, it uh, was so, it was a four wheel drive transmission. But the interesting thing about the, the Proteus motor, I believe, uh, it was uh, named Proteus after the uh, star Proteus. Uh, the star Proteus uh, supposedly changes its uh, shape on uh, different times and so the relationship to that is that the Proteus motor well the motor was named Proteus because it had the ability to be applied to different sorts of uses such as uh, an aeroplane, a car, a generating plant I think I were talking about at one stage it'd be pretty expensive to have lined up for a generator but anyway that was uh, the answer to the reason why it was called a Proteus. And um, just getting on to the, your specialty uh, topic now, your, the, your reason for actually being there on it, um, the Bluebird's rims and tyres arrived at the base camp uh, in separate crate, crates I believe. Who was it that assembled the wheels and what special efforts were needed to uh, ensure that they could cope with speeds of up to 500 miles per hour? Well my first job when we sorted ourselves out on arrival at uh, Maluruna Station. We had a little area set aside for the storage of the tyres as well as a, a tent set up to uh, uh, be able to put the tyres and the rims together and, and uh, get them in preparation for the attempt. Um, and that was done under canvas but uh, in a air-free or wind-free situation uh, for balancing purposes. Um, so interesting, that there were uh, uh, high-speed tyres and high-speed rims, and uh, as uh, the speed increased, uh, getting up to the land speed, real fair income land speed attempt, uh, various tyres were used. So that meant that there were something like about 80, 80 rims and, and uh, about 120 tyres. And these were all scattered around to a certain extent and my job was with the aid of a little uh, front end loader on a Fergie tractor I was, had to put all these uh, boxes together the same uh, for wheels on one side and or rims on one side and and tyres on the other side, so that then a chap by the name of Maury Constable from Melbourne, Dunlop, uh, he was able to fit the tyres and balance the tyres, which was very important. And also the interesting thing was when a tyre was completely made up, there was a little, little uh, stainless steel uh, thread put through the valve cap on the tyre so that it wouldn't come off because it was suggested that if the valve cap came off the tyre at 400 mile an hour it would have gone into orbit 
And that was one of the unusual things in those days that we were talking about things being in, in, in uh, orbit. He also inflated the tyres with nitrogen and uh, not just ordinary air. Uh, nitrogen being a gas that doesn't expand under heat. Molecules of nitrogen are a bit bigger than oxygen and so they have a less chance of of uh, getting through the through the tyre. And I think I mentioned before the first time for this uh, attempt that they used tubeless tyres. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you recall uh, how large each wheel was and uh, approximately the sort of weight of each wheel? Uh, I would say uh, about the size in height of a uh, rear tyre on a Ferguson tractor and the rim was very similar in shape. Uh, the, the rim was uh, an alloy, two wheels together when they were ready for transporting we had a T-piece made up and that was bolted in between the two rims so that we could put the hook from the uh, gantry on and, and uh, lift them onto the, onto the ute and uh, fully loaded we had four tyres and rims already mounted up on, on the ute. Yeah, the wheels on the Bluebird were nearly fully covered uh, as part by part of the vehicle's body. How did you go about changing the wheel and how long did that process take you? Oh, well, firstly, we, uh, to change the wheel, uh, it had its own jacking system, hydraulic jacking system, so we lift, uh, lifted it up off the uh, lake. Off the... That's the Bluebird itself was lifted yeah. up? Yeah, and uh, then we would uh, uh, take the spat off the the wheel, the wheel cover with a screwdriver and uh, a reasonable amount of care uh, taken. Then uh, the uh, job of undoing eight uh, nuts around the centre of the, uh, the rim. And we had to practice uh, changing and we were down to a time limit as well or to see how quick we could eventually do this. Uh, there were two tyre fitters for each car, uh, for each, uh, uh, um, for the beginning of the track and the end of the track, there were two tyre fitters, so that uh, one tyre fitter did the front and rear, uh, front and rear tyre on, say, on the right hand side, and the other tyre did, fitter did the tyre on the left hand side. And then as, as quick and, and as safe as possible, put the spats back on, because uh, in the, uh, doing the complete uh, or the final run, the, the um, land speed attempt record uh, had to be right down to uh, 10 tacks. And so the run was com started from the beginning of the, of the track and went over the 15 miles. Then we had an hour to turn the vehicle around, change the tyres and be back again to the end which they started from. Which uh, is an interesting concept to me uh, uh, in as much that Bluebird's turning circle would not have been all that sharp. Uh, it had to travel 15 miles overall at uh, great speed. How did they actually turn the Bluebird around at the end of each run along the course? Well, at, at full lock, of course, uh, we didn't have the power. The motor wasn't uh, on. The motor had been stopped and uh, at the end of a run. And uh, it was manpower, I think, uh, that, that we actually uh, pushed the, the uh, Bluebird around. It would, yeah, you need just about a 40-acre paddock to, to turn it around in. Yeah, I think we worked out that uh, the, the course itself was 15 miles long and I believe uh, actually about 50 yards wide. How was the course actually set up for the run-up timing section, the braking section? What, what was the uh, breakdown of that 15 miles? Well, to start off with, you had the beginning of, of the, the track and then each, each mile the, there was a banner set up for seven miles and that indicated to him where he was. Then the banner took a change of colour from yellow to red, which was the first one on the measured mile, and then through to the 
second red banner, which was the end of the measured mile, and then for the wind down from seven down to, to zero um, was run. So the track itself um, would have been something like uh, uh, 17 miles long because there was a bit of space between uh, at the end of the, the measured uh, distance uh, through to um, being able to work on the, the Bluebird. And, and during each of these speed runs, whereabouts were you posted on the, um, on the uh, track itself? Oh, out on the lake at the, at the end of the... Uh, I don't know why, I, was, I think I was always uh, out on the far end of it. Uh, the English guys, uh, they angled for a position to be always near the, the base camp for whatever reason, I don't know, but uh, anyway, that didn't really worry me. Closer to the beer, probably. <laughs> Incidentally, before a, a serious run was taken, there was a, um, an elfin racing car there and it had tyres exactly the same as the Bluebird in as much that it didn't, they didn't have any tread on the tyres. And so the Elfin uh, had a Tapley meter in it and a Tapley meter measures the braking efficiency of the car or the adhesion of the surface. And uh, so the Elfin always did a, a test run to check the efficiency, the adhesion of the, of the lake surface whether it be more, like early morning, early morning being around about 10 o'clock or uh, mid-afternoon, 2, 3 o'clock. And that was about the time that, that the uh, runs were made from around about 10 and finished at about 4 at the most. You showed me before some photos of you actually sitting in the elf and uh, did you actually have that as an official uh, part of the thing or it was just you having a bit of a spin in it? Oh, I was having a bit of a spin and I was given the opportunity to, to take it out. It was very interesting, very unusual to, to drive on, on Lake Eyre because there is nothing, nothing at all to gauge your speed or, or direction because uh, of the vastness of the lake and the fact that Mirage takes a, a fair sort of a uh, part of the plays a fair part of the unusual part of the, the lake. Whereabouts on Lake Eyre itself was the um, the course set up for the record attempt? Oh, you know, if you've got a, a map, if you can relate to it, it's uh, in Madigan's, Madigan's Golf. And, and Madigan's Golf uh, gave an area, uh, I suppose, uh, would be something like about 30 miles from, from the land uh, out to to wherever they wanted to, to run the, the uh, uh, track. So it was a very big project as far as uh, uh, track was concerned. They had a lot of trouble, or problems, not trouble, but problems with um, preparation uh, for the, uh, the track <coughs> in the first instance because it was a bit unknown and they hadn't uh, experienced this and there was a lot of a lot of salt uh, uh, humps and uh, because when when the lake has water on it uh, salt water tends to froth up a bit for the want of a better expression and as the, the water evaporates and dries out that froth then becomes a solid um, mass of, of uh, salt uh, like a crust and so this was spread across the, the uh, track that they decided to um, use and so there was the track preparation. There was oh, four or five different types of machines involved in uh, preparing the track from, from a, uh, a patrol grader to a, um, a milling machine. And the milling machine, if you can imagine, uh, would take uh, about uh, oh, 50 centimetres, I suppose, um, uh, section, and it had to be 15 miles, you know, and that was just too slow, that was out of the question. But at the same time also, what it prepared the lake for was just too smooth, it was almost like glass. Mm. 
So after a lot of decision and uh, that sort of thing happening as far as the track was concerned, uh, it was finished up that uh, a uh, railway line towed behind a vehicle did the job perfectly. So it was very, very simple. How long would that uh, length of railway steel or iron have been that they dragged uh, down? It would, would have been perhaps about four metres. Four metres. Or four, yeah, about six metres, I suppose, yeah. So it would have still taken them a fair way. Oh, yeah. Time to do but it, behind a tractor or yeah. uh, they were able to move alongside seven or eight kilometres an hour. And uh, actually, I believe that the grader that you spoke of earlier actually became bogged on the lake itself. Oh. Yeah, yes, uh, and that caused a bit of uh, excitement. See, the lake, uh, uh, to enter onto the lake um, from the land surrounding, <coughs> you're going over a, a very thin surface of, of salt, obviously, um, and then it gradually, as you further you get out into the lake, the thicker the salt becomes. So to enable us to uh, take vehicles onto the lake, there had to be a preparation made, and what they finished up doing was to put uh, some uh, sheet uh, reinforcing rod down uh, and laid that for about oh, 100 metres, I suppose. Um, and uh, that was uh, good enough to take us out onto the lake to, to the uh, thickness where um, uh, it was safe to drive around on. Mind you, for the very first time I drove on the lake, I was a bit scared um, because of the possibility of breaking through, but uh, that sort of uh, went after being on the lake a few times. And, and uh, um, where we were actually operating the uh, track itself was, I guess, uh, something like about uh, 60 centimetres, a couple of feet deep thick rather of salt. I've actually got a, a little sample of salt which uh, uh, I was able to collect. Uh, old Elliot Price had cut quite a bit of salt as a souvenir uh, money uh, uh, venture and uh, he cut that up with a with a um, uh, saw vent in a saw vent like you would uh, cut timber. What facilities were set up on the lake uh, for the officials and, and the like to uh, use uh, in this uh, record attempt? Well, this is where the army uh, came into to force and their reason for being at Lake Air also, uh, in as much as their, their uh, uh, tents and, and marquees were used to, to house the, the bluebird and, and other uh, parts uh, that were required. We, the, Dunlop, the Dunlops had a little section uh, within the um, uh, marquee for our uh, uh, benefit of uh, protecting uh, um, what we had. Was all the equipment, uh, vehicles, etc., left out on the lake at night? Yeah, the, uh, the uh, Bluebird, when it was on the lake, it was on the lake until taken off. Now, yeah, that sounds a bit Irish, but. but um, <laughs> Yeah, it was uh, on there for oh, four or five uh, days, uh, four or five nights. Um, and I think they would have had security there. I don't sort of quite remember that part of it. But when you consider that it was just so far away from, from uh, anywhere, mm -hmm. <coughs> that uh, would have been pretty hard to have uh, uh, for anybody to, to uh, get out there. They really would have had to know what they were doing and where they were going more so. And what was the day-to-day -day like, uh, life like for you and the others out there on the course? Well, some days was was uh, all go, and other days um, there was uh, quite a lot of uh, sitting around waiting, waiting for Campbell or the, the skipper, as they called him, uh, to uh, get all fired up himself and and uh, uh, do a uh, run. At one stage, um, <coughs> give you some of the things that happened, they had a, a radio uh, in the uh, Bluebird and um, um, the idea was that he could uh, talk to the base uh, radio 
about the conditions that he was driving under at the time and, and they had a problem with that in as much that the aerial for the uh, radio on, in the Blueburn was placed over uh, a mudguard and um, I think it was the rear right hand mudguard and so uh, the mechanics decided that they uh, would change it from there because it was being um, blocked out by so-called uh, uh, salt so they shifted it over to the fin and that took a whole day so if you could imagine with two or three people working flat out to change that and there's about 30 of us standing around doing nothing and uh, anyway uh, I stuck my nose in and I said to Leo Villa who was Campbell's head mechanic I said, what's the problem? I asked what the problem was and he said, oh, well, we're losing contact with Skipper after about five miles. They had the base radio set at the beginning of the track and up the track about five miles, they'd lose contact with him. Well, you don't have to be a Philadelphian lawyer to work out why don't you shift the base radio up the track and have contact all the time. So I suggested to Leo that they might do that. Oh, he said, uh, no, he said, Skipper wants it done this way and this is the way it is. So that was the type of uh, the situation that uh, us Aussies had to work under. <laughs> so was it at Lake Air where radio communications were used in Bluebird at, uh, were yeah, installed? Right. On the lake itself, on the yeah, lake itself. on the lake itself. There were quite a few different very odd conditions that, that uh, you, you don't, a normal driving you wouldn't come across and that is, uh, as I mentioned before, mirage uh, on the roadway at times, you know, certain conditions you'll see mar mirage. Well out there it was just you know, terrific, the, the mirage uh, effect. Uh, Quite often you'd see a, a vehicle getting along with what looked to be without any wheels on it and it was just the mirage had sort of covered the wheels up or distorted the, the wheels, so to speak. Just now reflecting back on what you were saying before about the technicians moving the aerial, it must have got pretty boring at times for uh, some of you while you're out there on the lake. Well, yeah, it did. And uh, at times uh, when they decided that was enough for the day, that we should all pack up and go back home now, oh, what a blessing that was, you know that we could uh, at least be doing something even if we were just driving driving home. To overcome this boredom factor, I believe they uh, had some special entertainment arranged for the team members to try and boost the morale. Uh, what sort of uh, entertainment? That's right, yeah, well, uh, Campbell's uh, uh, wife, uh, Tanya, she, she was very friendly with uh, Leray Desmond and they were both uh, uh, singers and uh, anyway they, uh, Leray Desmond visited us, uh, us uh, uh, up there and the, both these girls uh, put on a couple of shows there and uh, that improved the morality. This was back at Malura a Homestead where they did this you know and so uh, there was always if you could imagine driving from Renmark to Barmra that's about the distance that it was from Mulurina to the lake. So there were lots of things going through your mind. What's the day going to bring today? What are we going to do? What, is he going to make the attempt, you know? And uh, this sort of thing. Have we got this? Have we got that? And uh, so uh, lots of times that was the feeling I had as to uh, what was going to happen, you know, what we were looking at, uh, letting ourselves in for. I noticed today, uh, with the spring being upon us, uh, we're having a few difficulties with the flies. Were they much of a problem up there at Lake Air? Yes, that's for sure. Uh, here again, the fact that I'd lived in the country most of my, well, all my life, and um, at the age of uh, 31, I'd, I'd uh, experienced uh, various uh, conditions, you know, that relate to uh, rain coming. And, and one was I always thought if there were a lot of flies around, it was a pretty fair indication 
that we were going to be in for some rain. And this proved to, to be true. Uh, even at the very beginning, there were lots of flies around and that went on for three or four weeks, you know. And we had this until it all busted this, this uh, particular uh, night. We'd actually finished a day on uh, the lake and uh, came back, everybody was sort of quite happy with what the future was going to be the next couple of days. We're going to make this attempt, you know. And uh, we were having our evening meal and the heavens opened up with lightning and thunder and then rain and did it come down. And I think straight away everybody jumped up and were headed for their vehicle to drive back out to the lake and retrieve stuff that was theirs on the lake, including the bluebird. But I wasn't sort of quite so quick in moving for, I always felt that self-preservation is pretty important. And uh, to me, I wasn't sure how long I was going to be out on the, the lake. So I got uh, one of the, the chefs to make up a bit of a, uh, a meal pack for me and uh, I think I was about the only one that, that uh, finished up with having a nice cold chicken under my arm to, to and on the seat to, to uh, have a, a chew at. And so uh, uh, we headed out to, to, uh, to the lake then, dark of course, and uh, everything, uh, there was water out there, water about uh, two or three inches deep I suppose, and uh, um, no great decision, it was just uh, made that the bluebird had to come off the lake so uh, and that was about five miles I suppose for, uh, from the base camp to the edge of the lake and so that happened and uh, I have a couple of photos of uh, somebody took for me, I was you know uh, the next day or within a couple of days uh, was able to get a good view of the, the bluebird itself. So the bluebird was obviously uh, recovered safely that night. Oh, yeah. Uh, at about what time of the night would they have finally oh, got About to... nine, ten o'clock, I suppose. In, in the dark, as you said. And what about all the other equipment that was out there on the lake? Yes, we had to cover what we could move uh, because we weren't sure how, how uh, deep the water was going to be. So anyway, uh, there were about four or five of us that it's like from the tyre side of it, uh, including Andrew uh, Mustard. Uh, I don't know whether the older tyre fitters came with us. Uh, I rather think that they were exempted from it because their age and the, and the job that we had to do. But uh, us younger ones uh, uh, had to go out and uh, so we did that. And then the day came and I think it was perhaps a couple of days after it decided that the attempt was going to be uh, finished uh, then, postponed till the next year, till better conditions. But it meant then, as far as Dunlops were concerned, I mentioned these banners, and there were 15 of them, and uh, so they were of considerable value. And so they had to be retrieved off the lake. So again, Andrew Mustard said to me, Righto, Ted, I want you to come with me and we're going to drive out onto the lake. And I said, what? We're going to drive out onto the lake and retrieve these banners because they're quite of value and we'll need them for our next attempt. So, oh, OK. So we uh, uh, fitted out the, the uh, ute and uh, with uh, some sleepers, uh, wooden sleepers, just in case we were to break through the surface and here we were when we got out onto the lake, uh, we're driving around in water about three inches uh, deep and uh, so we had to find these uh, banners and then we found the first one and then headed due uh, west and uh, went out to the very last banner, turned around and then picked them up as we came back so that we uh, knew exactly where we were. And the uh, marquee, the army marquee, was still still intact, so they had the job of pulling that down. And uh, so uh, um, it took us a whole day from, 
Oh, I reckon it was about from seven o'clock in the morning. We left uh, Maluruna till, yeah, seven o'clock at night when we got back again, having travelled all that distance right out. But uh, I suppose I could say that uh, I'm one of the few very rare people that uh, have ever driven on Lake Air when it's had water on it. So uh, uh, something to uh, remember that uh, that by. And you were successful in the recovery of all 15 very valuable banners. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't know what happened to them in the end, like they were used again the next year. Which was when he had his successful land, yeah. uh, world land speed record. Um, once you were, you, you were back, obviously the um, attempt had been called off. How did you actually travel back from Maluruna Station to get back home to Renmark? Um, well, as I said early, I drove up to Maluna and that wasn't possible. Well, well, we didn't need to do that to get back. So we actually, the team, there were four or five of us that we actually were flown back by, by a chartered aircraft that Dunlop's paid for. And uh, then we had a bit of a conference uh, back in Adelaide in, in Dunlop's uh, uh, office, uh, Ken Scrutton's office, as to the future and uh, so that uh, was carried out for uh, a couple of hours, a bit of a discussion, and then it was decided to... So I came home, back to Renmark, and uh, then I uh, got a letter from Ken Scrutton to, uh, about three weeks after, got a letter to say that uh, we were going to return back to to Lake Air, or to Maluna rather, not to the lake. Uh, they're going to return back to Maluna to uh, prepare the vehicles for storage and uh, uh, then sort of house them so that they could be used on the next uh, attempt, which happened to be the next year. So we flew back, did that job, and then flown back to Adelaide again. Uh, and uh, then I uh, came back to, to Renmark uh, uh, and so that was the end of my my engagement with, uh, uh, with uh, the attempt. Out of all of that, what is your most enduring memory of your involvement with Donald Campbell's 90, 1963 World Land Speed Record attempt? Well, the fact that I was employed uh, to uh, be part of uh, the famous team, if we can, or the infamous team, and the famous ones for the next year. But uh, yeah, when I considered that there was so many uh, guys that, that could have done the job, maybe the same as uh, that, I, uh, that I did, I just sort of thought that uh, uh, it was just uh, uh, so good to be involved with uh, a worldwide uh, project.